are recipes by the front door and an email list. Um, on the recipes is basic information on how you can contact me, as well as a blog. Um, I give you that because in an effort to conserve paper, I printed up one recipe. We'll be making three different recipes for today. Um, so definitely check the blog. That's where I'm going to post everything that I do today. And if you're not able to make the second class, which I'm doing here as well, um, I'm going to post the recipes from that class as well. So I am a local cooking school teacher. Um, I cook uh, a monthly class at Sea Rocket Bistro. Uh, I do a hands-on cooking class out of the restaurant. Ironically, we have uh, the next one's tomorrow. Uh, it is a hands-on Thai vegan cooking class. Um, and then we'll have in May three different uh, sustainable seafood cooking classes. Uh, but for today, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to talk to you about uh, CSA baskets. And we are really lucky in California, we or in San Diego in general, we have amazing farmers markets, which are created by amazing farmers. And the amazing farmers allow for you to get these community-supported agriculture baskets, CSA. Um, what it is, you're basically kind of buying, in the technical term, you're buying a share in their farm. In actuality, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to give you money, and once a month, you are going to give me the best of what you have. Or you are going to give me some really, really interesting stuff that I would never usually buy on my own, but is really great produce nonetheless. Uh, so what I did yesterday is I went down to Susie's farm, and I got their large CSA box. And I mean, it is, boy, it was large. Um, so large, in fact, it didn't fit my fridge. I put ice blocks on it last night. <laughs> and what I did is I went through and I kind of broke things down into figuring out what I can do with my CSA. Now, for me, that's fairly simple because I know all about food and I think about stuff. And I'm like, oh, I can do this and I can do that and I can do this. Uh, good sources for you, the internet. You can go to a website like epicurious.com and they have a search engine. And you can put in Swiss chard. You can put in kale. You can put in whatever you have, and it will come up with a recipe for you. Um, I'm going to give you some basic recipes today, uh, and I really want to <laughs> showcase what we have in that CSA box. And what I try to do is, like with greens, I love spinach greens, I love sauteed greens, I love kale. But for a lot of people, they're kind of bitter. So I'll add a little honey, I add a little pine nuts. Maybe I'm going to make a salad because there's all kinds of lettuce stuff in my CSA basket. Well, I want to make a simple dressing. So I want to show you guys how easy it is to make your own dressing and why I never buy a bottle of dressing. And then lastly, uh, one of the most common things you either find in a CSA basket or at your farmer's market are beets. There are always beets at a, at a farmer's market. And they look really cool. They've got big stems. And they're really pretty. And then you're like, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> and the other thing is you're like, ew, I had them. My mom made them. I never want to eat those again. Uh, and I'm going to show you a really cool way to use the beets for steak. So why don't we kind of get started so that we'll have enough time to really get to showcase you, to showcase everything for you. Um, so first things first, I'm going to make a cold beet soup. Um, it's kind of a little less scary. It's cold. It's great for the summer, which means all summer long when you go to your farmer's market, you can make this really refreshing cold beet soup. So the first thing I did with my cold beet soup is I got my beets from my CSA basket. Um, these in particular are Chayoga beets. Uh, they are an heirloom Italian beet. Um, they are a light pink color. Generally, when I talk to people about beets, I say that there's three basic categories. There's the I love beets, which is a, the dark red, almost blood red beet. Like, you love beets when you love those. Um, and then there's the I kind of want to get introduced to beets. Uh, that is your golden beet. That is your yellow or your golden color beet. Because it's a lighter color. It's a little bit sweeter. It's not as scary. And then if you're looking for the mid-range where you're like, you're, you're segueing from the like, I'm kind of getting started to I love beets, uh, you're going to go for one of these. They are a beautiful combination. They're this wonderful kind of light pink color when cooked. Um, they're a little sweeter. They're not quite as pungent as the full flavored beets. So they're going to be a little bit milder for you. So these are your Chayoga beets. And they are currently in the Susie's Farm CSA basket. So what you want to do with these, uh, the first step in the recipe says that you are going to either boil or you're going to uh, roast your beets. May I make a suggestion? Never boil beets. I say that because it's the easiest thing to do. You throw them in a pot of water, you boil them until the skin starts to come off, and when the skin comes off, you're done. Um, that also gets rid of a lot of the flavor. So what you want to do, cut off the top and the bottom. Doesn't mean you throw this away. It's still completely edible. We're actually going to use some of it in the next recipe. But what you want to do is take your beets, once you cut off the top and the bottom, take a piece of aluminum foil, <laughs> woo, 
and you want to place your beets in the aluminum foil. I personally, depending on the color of the beet, will put a little bit of vinegar on them. So if it's a yellow beet, I'm going to use white wine vinegar. If it is a red beet, I'm going to use red wine vinegar. Uh, this fell in the mid-range category, so it got white wine vinegar or apple cider. Um, and a little olive oil, salt and pepper. And then what you want to do is fold them completely in foil. And you're going to place them in your oven about 400 degrees for an hour to an hour and a half. What that does is it roasts the beet, which means all the natural sugars, all the natural sweetness come out of the beet. It also doesn't leach away any of the flavor. You don't end up with a big pot of water full of beet flavor and a beet that doesn't taste like anything. You get a beautifully flavorful beet. When you're all done, they're super simple to peel because you can just literally wipe the skin right off of them. And now you have your roasted beets. At this point, you can puree them and put them into a soup like we're going to do today. Uh, you can slice them and put them into your salads. You can do all kinds of fun things to them. The roasted beets are just good to have. You can literally bring them home from the grocery store, undo them, they take off the tops of the bottoms, put them in foil, put them in your oven, let them roast. And then you can put them in your fridge with the peel still on them. And whenever you're ready, peel them and eat them. And if you're like me and you're a weirdo, they're like snacks in your fridge. Not everybody does that, but for me, they're like, it's like opening my fridge, like, ooh, I've got a snack, it's beets. <laughs> I know, I'm special. How often do they keep like that? Um, they will keep about a week. I wouldn't really go more than a week because the uh, no, fridge does bad things. If you need to peel them and take the tapered off, or that's really the nutritious part of it. The, the small tail end? Yeah. Um, I take it off just because it sits easier in the pan. That doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to throw that away. I can take this when I'm done and just chop it up and throw it in with something else that I'm cooking or put it into a salad. Um, but it's very hard to wrap this in foil and keep it from like disintegrating or rolling around in your oven. What if you just use a covered baking dish instead of using all that aluminum? Um, the aluminum actually helps to seal it in completely and it keeps it from you necessarily having to clean as much. But if you don't mind scrubbing and you know if you can't recycle your aluminum foil in your area and feel free to use a pan with a lid on top. You just want to make sure that, I would say, a very small pan, something where the steam can concentrate around the beet, so it almost helps to steam it, as opposed to if you used a big, huge pan and put a tiny beet in the middle. All that moisture and liquid in there. Huh? I said I'm not an idiot. I wouldn't use a great big pan. No, but some beet. people would. They might just say, OK, well, I'm going to grab a pan with a lid and throw them in the oven. And if they did that, they would end up scorching or burning the bottom of the pan. Um, so we've got our beets that we have roasted. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of celery and some shallots. So these were the two things that weren't in my CSA basket. Pretty much everything that we're going to do today, 90% of it came from the CSA basket, but there's a few things that you're going to need to kind of add to. So what I did is I'm using shallots because they're a little bit milder than an onion. Um, if you've never had a shallot before or you're not too familiar with them, uh, they are available in every grocery store. And to me personally, a shallot is flavor-wise um, a cross between red onion and garlic. So it's a little bit milder than an onion, it's a little bit sweeter, but it still has a bit of pungency to it. So it goes really nicely with our sweet beets. So what we're going to do with our shallot, is we're just gonna take, cut off the top, leave the root end on. Whenever I'm using some sort of onion, I leave the root end on it to hold it together. So if I had a whole onion, I'd slice it in half, leaving a little root on either side. And then I'm gonna take my knife and I'm gonna cut in. Yes, my knife is a little excessive for a tiny shallot, but I'm too lazy to go get another one. And then I'm going to cut down. Basically, what I've done with my onion is I've put lines this way and lines that way. I've created a grid pattern. So that when I cut from front to back, I get a dice. I just want to dice up my shallot, and then I'm going to do the same with my celery. Uh, what I like to do for celery is I kind of follow the natural ridges to make sticks, and then sticks into cubes. Kind of the general rule of thumb when chopping anything, sticks into cubes or planks, sticks and cubes. So once we get these chopped, uh, we don't want to put them in raw. We want to kind of soften them. Everything needs to be the same texture. So what we're going to do for this is we're going to put a little bit of olive oil in the pan. It's a little excessive, but okay. Uh, we'll put our olive oil in and then we're going to put in our shallots and our celery. Now, if I was doing this at home, I would get my olive oil hot first, and then I would add in my carrots and my celery so I heard a little sizzle. Uh, you don't want to put your vegetables right into a cold pan of oil. The oil will just suck into your vegetables. Hot oil, you now create like a barrier between the vegetable and the oil. The oil goes in and it sears, and it cooks the vegetable as opposed to the vegetable sucking in the oil. So I've got my pan. 
in my stove top that's gently smoking. Um, and I'm going to saute these until they're softened. And I just want to kind of see the uh, shallots start to become translucent, which means they go from opaque to kind of clear and shiny. Once they go translucent, I'm going to add about a half a cup to a cup of water. And what I'm doing here is I'm kind of creating my own vegetable stock. I'm creating this kind of infused liquid, but I'm also going to soften all these vegetables so they're really, really soft and tender. So now I've got my shallots and my celery that are soft and tender. I've got my beets that are soft and tender that I've chopped up. And then what I'm going to put in this to help lightly sweeten these vegetables are some agave nectar. Um, agave nectar is also available at every grocery store. Uh, oddly enough, it's the basis for all tequila. Um, it is the nectar from an agave plant that's sweet. It's a very natural sweetness, which I find I prefer with something like this with beet soup. It's a very natural, gentle sweet, as opposed to this like hard, astringent, like sugar sweet. Uh, it's also healthier for you than, say, sugar. So we'll put the agave nectar, once our vegetables have boiled down, they're completely soft and tender, we're going to put a little agave nectar in. The hot water, the hot liquid will help to dissolve the agave nectar, which means it won't just be a puddle in our cold soup. So it's going to dissolve into there. Um, then what we want to use is some uh, things to liquefy our soup. So what I want to use is unsweetened cranberry juice, along with some chicken broth and some vinegar. Now this may sound strange, like I don't, I don't get it, it's, it's soup, why are you putting juice in there? Um, the cranberry juice is actually naturally kind of tart, and the cider vinegar is acidic. So you're getting on like a sweet tart flavor. It'll help to add depth and a little bit more intensity to your soup than say if you just added water or just added vegetable broth, that could make it really, really vegetable-y. So now we've got our sweetening agents in there, and we've got our vegetables in there, and what you're going to do with the whole thing is put it in a big blender or food processor and puree it down until it's smooth. Do you see one? No. I didn't feel like dragging my food processor. It's like 14 cups. It's a heavy thing. So I did that for you last night. Now, what I did with this last night and why I preferably did it yesterday was so it could sit overnight. Majority of soups taste better if you make them a day ahead of time. <coughs> they have that time for all the flavors to kind of marry and blend together, especially a cold soup. There's no heating where you're kind of boiling all the ingredients together and they all start to come together as one big family. You're just pureeing them together. So by chilling them overnight, you get this wonderful emulsification of flavors. As opposed to you get like a really strong beet and then a really strong vegetable and then a really strong something else, you get all the flavors together. It also makes a lovely pink color which is also what helps with the cranberry juice, because they're already pink in color, or red if you had red beets. Uh, obviously, if you're going to do this with yellow beets, you wouldn't want to use regular cranberry juice. You'd use white cranberry juice, or else you'd end up with this weird yellow-pink thing that would be attractive. All right, so now we've got our soup. It's nice and chilled, and it's going to be very refreshing. Um, but we want to add a little bit more interest to our soup. So what I've done is I've just taken some regular sour cream, and a little bit of water and put it in a container and shook it together. What this does is it allows for my uh, sour cream to be lighter in density than my soup. So if I just took a dollop of sour cream, it would hit my soup and it would fall to the bottom. This way I've now lightened up the sour cream and I can drizzle it over the top. So I can get little dollops of sour cream on top of my soup as opposed to it falling right through my soup. Now, soup is good, but herbs are better. <laughs> So whenever I cook, I really try to use as many fresh herbs as possible. They are, to me, the, the best bulk of flavor that you can get for anything without adding a lot of calories or fake things or anything like that. So for today, I've got some micro basil for soup from Susie's Farm. Along with the micro basil, I'm going to use a little bit of baby dill and some chives. Um, any soft herb will work for this. And by soft herb, I mean an herb that doesn't have a big, thick, woody stem. So parsley, chives, basil, um, any of them will work. And to add a little extra flavor, I'm just going to chop them all together. So I'm going to take my basil and my chives. And for the basil, I'm going to use my knife to cut them. But for my chives, a very simple technique is just to use a pair of kitchen scissors. And they need to be kitchen scissors. They shouldn't be like the scissors you use for craft projects when you bring them in your kitchen to cut stuff. Um, kitchen scissors ideally should separate, so you can wash them, get in the nooks and crannies, get them really nice and clean, as opposed to craft scissors that don't. And just hold your herbs together and give them a nice snip. It's a little bit more rustic looking, but I like to say rustic means it looks homemade. 
If it looked too nice and neat, no one would think you made it yourself. They think you buy it from the store. So I'm going to chop up these herbs, and I'm going to put this all to the side, and I promise you, at the end, you will get to taste this. It's a little too difficult to have you all come up at once and taste them. So let me give these a quick chop. And then, are there any questions before I move on to the next recipe? Are we all familiar with beets? Have we ever tried beets before? There's some nodding. Ah, yes. I made a sad mistake with a friend of mine who absolutely can't stand beets. And I was like, ooh, taste my soup. And he was like, ooh. So you have to be careful. You can't introduce beets to everybody. Not everybody's a fan. All right, so for the next recipe, I wanted to try and do something that used beets, or sorry, the beet tops. But I also wanted to use a lot of the beautiful greens that came in the CSA basket. So in my CSA basket this week, there was Swiss chard. Um, and if you're lucky, buy a Swiss chard plant. It will grow in your garden forever and ever, unless you're unlucky like me and it randomly hails in Solana Beach. Because now all my Swiss chard looks like it's got, I don't know, it's been attacked by some monster. It's got giant holes in it. Um, and then we've got monarch kale, which is a purple kale. It is, uh, for some people, it's ornamental. It's also very, very delicious. And then we have some collard greens. And then lastly, I'm going to use some of my leftover beet tops, as well as some spinach. <coughs> so you can see that I had all of these wrapped in paper towel. Um, what I had done before we got started tonight was that I took them and I soaked them. So whenever I have uh, greens of any kind, because they grow so low to the ground, that means they're just literally in dirt. They're right on dirt, so they can be very, very dirty. So I let them sit in a big sink of water, a big sink of water. And what happens is the dirt that's very loose falls to the bottom and the leaves float to the top. So now the grime's on the bottom and I didn't have to do much. And then as I take them out and I dry them off a little bit, I get rid of any extra dirt. So it makes it a little bit easier to clean them. Um, for most of these, the really tough portion of them is actually the stems and not the leaves. So what we want to do for all of them is separate the leaves from the stems. And all you need to do for that is simply peel down the side. So I've peeled down my collard greens. And I don't want to use the stems for my collard greens or for my kale. Um, for what <laughs> I'm doing in this particular recipe, I'm cooking it fairly quickly. So the, the stems won't tenderize as well. Uh, if I was going to make a soup, I could take the, separate the leaves from the stems and then I would chop these very, very finely, and then I would boil them for a little while in my soup, and then I would add in my leaves later on in the recipe. Um, you definitely want to cook the stems for, for uh, a very long time until they soften and tenderize, at least like 25, 30 minutes. Whereas the leaves, they can cook fairly quickly. They can cook in a matter of minutes. I think that's a huge misnomer with things like collard greens or greens in general. Um, most of us only know you know, soul food collard greens. You think you have to cook them until they're gray or brown with a ham hock and onions and hot sauce, and it doesn't have to happen that way. So I've separated my leaves from my stems, um, except for my Swiss chard. I'm going to separate them, but I'm going to keep the stems. I find that the stems on the Swiss chard aren't as tough. Um, what I've actually found since I've been growing it in my backyard is if you take the Swiss chard and you plant all of your plants very close together, they never get this large which means the stems are always very, very tender. It means they're almost like a whole plant of baby chard, which is great, especially if you have a small apartment. You can just put it on your patio and have a little bucket of your chard. And it's great because then you can just pluck them and put them into your salad, they're so tender. So once I remove my leaves from my stems, put this next one right here, um, I want to take and I'm going to roll them. I'm just going to roll them up like a big cigar. And once I have rolled them, I'm going to take my knife, I'm going to cut the whole roll in half, and then I'm going to cut it into pieces. So that is my turnip greens. I'm going to do the same with my kale. Cut it in half, and then cut it into pieces. What I really love most about this dish is it becomes very, very bright and colorful. All of the different greens, because they have a different color and texture, they add a lot more color and texture to the recipe. And then, of course, you would do the same with your beet greens. I've already done that with a small batch that I have right here. Um, if you didn't want to use the beet greens in this recipe, what I found that I like with them as well is I curry them, which 
means I saute some onions and I add a little bit of curry powder and I add in my beet greens and I saute them. Because beet greens have a very strong flavor, the curry powder really holds up, holds up well to them. So it's uh, another application for them. Um, for my stems, I'm just going to go from one end to the other and I'm going to cut them into little pieces. Uh, the leaves can be combined together, but the stems I want to keep separate. They take a little bit longer to cook. So now I've got my stems. And then before you got here, I have my uh, chard. I have my kale. Wheat. It looks like a lot, but trust me, when it cooks down, it won't be much. And then the third container I have over here is a nice big bowl of spinach. Uh, the spinach needs to be kept separate from the chard and the kale and the turnip greens because it goes in separately in the recipe. Um, spinach does not take as long to cook as the other greens. It's definitely much more tender than the other greens. So we're going to put it in later on in the recipe. So the first things first we're going to need for this recipe is some minced garlic. Um, I never buy pre-minced garlic in the grocery store. I don't think it even tastes like garlic. It's some other foreign substance. Uh, what I do do is I take whole cloves, I cut off the brown bit at the end, and then I take my knife with the handle over the edge of the cutting board so it sits completely flat, and I tap it. And that allows for me to peel the skin off easily. And then once I get the skin off, I'm going to mince it. Um, you could use a garlic press if you had one at home. I have one. I do find it's just one more thing for me to have to clean. So if I don't have to, I'm not going to use it. Uh, so once I get the skin off the top, I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to flatten it. Wow, this table's a little hollow. It makes it sound more aggressive than it really is. And then I'm going to rock my knife back and forth. And I'm going to keep going back and forth until it's nice and finely minced. If you have stainless steel countertops at home and you don't like the smell of garlic <laughs> on your fingers, if you take and rub your fingers on the stainless steel when you're done, uh, the, the smell that comes from garlic is from the garlic oil, the essential oils in it. Stainless steel is porous. You can rub your fingers and get rid of the garlic smell. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this pan here. We're going to add in a little bit of oil. I'm using olive oil, but any oil will do. Um, personally, at home, I use a lot of coconut oil, um, but olive oil works just fine. It's an easy oil that we use in all the recipes. Once the pan is hot, I'm going to add in my garlic. You're kind of sizzling. <laughs> Once I get the garlic in there, I'm going to add in my shard stems. And I'm going to add in some water. Whenever I cook, I cook garlic only until it's fragrant, not until golden brown or any color. Um, what I find with garlic is it goes from brown to burnt like that. So if you put it in the pan, the pan's hot, and you can smell it, go on to the next step. The garlic will always cook in the rest of the recipe. You don't have to worry about it being undercooked. But nobody likes the taste of burnt garlic. So you always want to put in the garlic. When you can smell it, go on to the next step. If you're congested, just look at it and give it a second and keep going. <laughs> All right, so we're going to put in our shard stems and wait for them to cook a little. Um, while I wait for them to cook a little, are there any questions about any of the greens? Are we all familiar with greens? Do we all know that we should eat them? <laughs> I have used dandelion greens. They're slightly bitter, um, but I still think they're wonderful. They're great in this application as well. Um, so the recipe that I'm doing now is based off of a traditional Sicilian recipe. Um, in Sicilian cooking, they do this great kind of combination of sweet and savory. Uh, it's from a lot of the kind of Spanish, Moorish, Moroccan influences. And what they do is they add some sort of sweetener in with things. Traditionally, the rest we would call for honey, um, uh, pine nuts, and golden raisins. They love their bitter greens in Italy. So when you combine in the kind of bitter with sweets, and, and it, it adds a really nice flavor combination. So dandelion greens would work wonderful. Um, I like dandelion greens also pureed into a soup. Um, I will take and I will blanch them. And then I put them into a pot of, say, vegetable broth or chicken broth, and then puree it really, really nice. Yeah. All right, so now that they're cooking fabulously, um, I'm going to take all of my greens except for my spinach. So I'm going to start by putting in my Swiss chard. And I just want to turn this around a little bit to make sure it wilts just a little bit so I can fit the rest of the greens in. I'm going to add in my kale. And then I'm going to let this cook down just a little bit, and then I'll add in the other greens. This is a great time.
to use a walk? If you have a walk at home and you never use it or you always try to find other things to do with it, um, cooking greens in a walk is awesome. Because walks are the only thing big enough to hold them all for what they start with and then you end up with a good amount of greens. Uh, one of the big things in this particular recipe, I am using the CSA's uh, spinach. Um, baby spinach would work, but I really try to avoid using the bags of baby spinach for anything other than salads. Um, I find that baby spinach turns to baby food very quickly. Uh, once you start to cook it, it gets very mushy and it has a heavy texture and it's just kind of very off-putting to me after that. Um, but if in a sense of desperation you need to eat your good, healthy vegetables, and the only way to do that is to buy a pre-washed bag of greens, then, then do it. Um, how many people here actually belong to a CSA? Ooh, I like that. All right, so if you are not a CSA member, um, you should be. Uh, but there are all different types of CSAs out there. Um, there are CSAs that deliver to all different parts of the San Diego County. You can get a large CSA box, you can get a small CSA box, you can get a bi-monthly CSA box. Um, Really, there's a CSA box for every particular person or every person's choice. Let me see if I got everything in here. Last one. And actually, I just uh, recently, I'm looking into getting into a beef CSA. So CSA is no longer just for vegetables. You can now get your cow in a CSA as well. All right, so I'm going to put all of my greens right into my pan. And I am going to cover and let this sit for about five minutes. sort of covered. Covered is that okay? Um, so are there any other questions while we kind of wait on that one? Uh-huh. I've heard that some greens you need to have an acid like lemon or vinegar or something to get the nutrition out of it. Is that They say that the, it helps to release the nutrition in it, but I also find that it, it creates a browning effect. It kind of oxidizes, and to me they're less attractive. Um, personally, I think that if you add a little bit of water, allow them to steam a little bit, it helps to kind of pull out the chloroform or the vegetable part of it. Um, honestly, I think if you eat the vegetables alone, your body should be able to pull out the nutrients from it. I don't think that the lemon's required. I don't think it's like vitamin D and calcium. Um, I'm pretty sure your body can pull it out on its own. Are there any other questions? All right, so I'm not gonna give you the full five minutes I give them a nice stir and just kind of check on them. Yeah, we need the full five minutes. All right, so I'm gonna put this back on, turn down my heat a little bit, and let's talk about the other portion of our CSA, which is all the wonderful stuff we can turn into a salad. So along with the kale and the other great things in my CSA were these beautiful, colorful carrots, um, some wonderful fennel. I got a couple of different heads of lettuce as well as some arugula. And these are sunflower greens. So all of these greens in there require very little to turn them into an absolutely beautiful salad. And I think for a lot of people, the salad is, I don't know, I don't know when this happened. I don't know why people put too much complication into a salad. I guess it was like one too many trips to the soup plantation. And there's just so many options that you, you're like, oh God, what do I do? Do I make this dressing? Do I have to buy that dressing? No, it's, it's actually very, very simple. Um, so what we're gonna do with this is I'm gonna show you how to make a very simple dressing. We're just gonna take uh, some apple cider vinegar, um, a little bit of shallot, some olive oil, and honey. Um, I'm gonna use honey in this particular dressing, um, but really you could use uh, any kind of sweetener you wanted other than sugar. And the thing with the honey is it works as an emulsifier, which means it helps to bring the two things together. So oil and water don't want to go together. Oil and vinegar don't want to go together. Uh, honey is a natural emulsifier. Dijon mustard is a natural emulsifier. So you'll find those in most, most dressings. So you can see here, my greens are nice and wilted down. They're not wilted to the point where they're mush. They're just wilted down and they're soft and they're starting to become tender. So once I get those going, I'm then going to add in my spinach. And also by wilting down, I make enough room to add my spinach. Um, for the spinach, I basically did the same thing as the other greens. I just removed the tough stuff from the center. And by I, I mean the lovely ladies here who are volunteering. Who came in this morning and were like, ooh, what can we do to help? I was like, ooh, you want to play with spinach? <laughs> All right, so once I kind of 
kind of make enough room to get these into the pan. And if you notice, I'm trying to lift up the cooked greens from the bottom to put them on top and allow for my raw greens to fall to the bottom so that they can cook a little bit more with everything else. At this point, I'm going to drizzle in a little bit of honey. The honey at this point will soften inside the recipe, which means it will not just be a big dollop of honey, it will soften into the recipe. And that's going to be a mess, and we'll be washing that before we go home. All right, so let's put, uh, we're going to keep our lid off. I take the lid off at this point, because if you notice when I tilted to show you the greens, there's a bit of water that developed on the bottom. If I put the lid back on, I'll end up with a huge puddle on the bottom, and I don't want a puddle. I want all of my greens to kind of marry in together. So I'm just going to keep cooking this until my spinach is wilted. And while I wait on that, I'm going to start making my salad dressing and my salad for you. So uh, in my large bowl, my ginormous bowl, um, I'm going to put in Susie's Farm arugula. Um, if you are a fan of arugula, you need to buy it at a farmer's market or you need to grow it. Um, for some reason, the stuff that you buy at a grocery store doesn't taste like arugula. It has a very light, mild, almost lettuce-y flavor. Um, the beautiful, bright flavor that you get from a farmer's market or a farm fresh arugula, it has so much more peppery, lively flavor to it. It's much, much better. Um, I'm then going to add in some of these sprouts, and I gave these a rinse earlier. And just to make sure that they fit in with everything else, I'm just going to cut them into thirds and put them in. Um, I am a huge fan of what I refer to as the kitchen sink salad, which means everything goes in it but the kitchen sink. It just has a lot more flavor to me that way. Um, so this is fennel, or anise, um, or fennel if you're Italian. Um, what I like to do is I just get rid of the part that's ugly. Uh, I want to soak it or wash it really well before I get started. It's one of those things that also can get a lot of dirt in all the layers. Um, I'm going to cut off the bottom and cut off the tops. This does not mean I throw away the tops. Uh, the tops are absolutely delicious. The little fennel fronds are great as garnish for all kinds of stuff. Um, but they can be very stringy, almost like old celery. It's very, very stringy. So they're not very fun raw. Um, they are amazing sliced and made into fennel potato chips. They're my favorite that way. Um, they're also beautiful roasted. So if you just cut it into cubes, toss it in olive oil, salt, pepper, roast it in your oven. Absolutely wonderful that way. Not so good in my salad raw. So I'm going to stick these off to the side and focus on the fennel bulb, the bulb on the bottom. So I'm going to cut that in half, and I'm going to expose a little core on the bottom, kind of like you find in a cabbage bowl or a bowl of cabbage. Um, I'm going to cut that out. Again, that's completely edible, but it's something, again, that you'd want to eat when it's roasted and not necessarily raw in your salad. Uh, what I'm going to do with this, see if I can make some more room so people can see. I love that table, by the way. It's my new best friend. Um, so what you're going to do with this is you're going to take your knife and from side to side, following the natural angle of the round vegetable, you're going to slice into it, making thin strips. And if it gets too thin where you can't hold, or too small that you can't really hold it anymore, roll it on its side. And then just continue to do the same thing. Uh, fennel, to me, has a flavor, again, that's like a cross between celery and anise. It's very refreshing, but it's not like black licorice. You're not going to die from it. It's not like a shot of ouzo. It's delicious. Uh, it also will hold up very nicely with our arugula that's in there. So I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Now, I know I didn't have a ton of vegetables here today to play with. Um, it is kind of a weird seasonal change for us right now because we haven't quite had winter and we haven't quite had summer. Um, but are there any vegetables that I didn't go over today that you are dying to know all about? Bueller? <laughs> yes? I have a question about the stock. Can you put them into a stock? Yeah. Um, I generally try to keep things that are overly flavorful out of stocks. So if I was to make a stock at home, my base would be carrots, onions, and celery. Um, to that base, I would add things like uh, maybe some bell pepper. Um, I wouldn't add broccoli. I wouldn't add fennel. Um, they would become overpowering. They'd be too much flavor. 
if I was doing a recipe that called for fennel in it, and I was using vegetable stock, I would put them in there. But if you added them just into your vegetable stock and thought, oh, it's going to make it taste better, it's going to taste like fennel. And that's all your vegetable stock's going to taste like. All right, so my vegetables are all beautifully wilted down. I'm going to put in a little bit of salt and pepper. Uh, my preference always is some sort of kosher so salt or sea salt as opposed to an iodized salt. Um, why? Um, regular iodized salt has no flavor. Kosher salt, sea salt, um, those salts have a flavor to them, which means over time with iodized salt, you need to use more and more and more to get that salty flavor. The tongue becomes kind of numb to it. Whereas kosher salt, iodized, uh, sea salt, um, some of the other salts, they have a mineral quality or a flavor to them, so you don't have to use as much. Um, I'm going to add in my pine nuts at the very end because I don't want them to get soggy. I want them to keep their crunch and I want them to add flavor. And then, of course, the pepper I put in was freshly ground black pepper. Um, as much as it sounds like a really great idea to be able to go to Costco and buy for $7 a container this big of pepper, um, it will have no flavor by the time you finish it. The minute the pepper is ground, it starts to lose its flavor. So if you don't want to buy a big container of pepper. <coughs> All right. So I'm going to bring these over here to put into my salad because I always like to put a little salt and pepper into my salad. And I'm going to move this over this way. I'm just cleaning at this point because I, I like organization and I'm a little disorganized. Can you tell I haven't had my coffee? Mm -hmm. All right. So I've got my fennel in there. I've got my uh, sprouts in there. And now I want to throw in some beautiful carrots. They have these wonderful kind of multicolored carrots. Um, carrots beautiful stems. Uh, if at all possible, if you go to a grocery store and you find a carrot with a stem, buy it with a stem on. And when the lady at the cashier says, can I take off your stem, say no. Nope. Um, the stems actually help them to retain some of their flavor. Once you take the stems off, they start to lose some of their flavor. So the actual beautiful flavor of a carrot comes much better with the stem. Uh, a lot of traditional recipes will call for you to peel your carrots before you use them. Um, I find with grocery store carrots, I always peel them because those peels tend to be a little bit bitter or taste like dirt. Um, whereas farmer's market carrots, they haven't really gone through any major transportation. They have a thinner skin. They're a lot more flavorful. What I like to do with my carrots, and you'll probably see it better this way, um, I like to take a vegetable peeler, one that has a swivel head, and I go back and forth. And it cuts my carrot into beautiful ribbons. Do you the apple cider vinegar? So when I cut them into ribbons, they're now no longer just a big chunk of baby carrot floating in my salad. Have you noticed I have pet peeves about certain food? I want to know, are you going to use the carrot stems at all the The carrot tops have, um, they have a very distinct flavor. Um, some people say that you can use them in place of parsley. Um, I think in small amounts, like if I'm ever doing an herb salad, I'll throw a very small amount mixed in with lots of other herbs because it'll give that same kind of vegetal herbaceous quality mixed in with it. I think on its own, it's not something most people would really like. It's a little overpowering. Um, when it gets to this point, it's a little too small for me to hold and peel. Oh, it's my snack. And I'm just going to repeat with the other one. I also like this because it, it looks a little bit more interesting. Um, the next class I'm doing here is making things a little bit more kid friendly with your CSA. And I think the more interesting you can make your food, the more kids want to eat it, or people who don't like vegetables want to eat it. Um, for some reason, if you put in a big chunk of carrot, a kid can be like, ooh, it's a carrot, I don't want it. You put it in this shade little orange purpley thing, and they're like, ooh, what's that? <laughs> Looks a little bit more interesting. I'm very much about sneaking vegetables and hiding things from children and making them eat it. It's kind of fun. It's my own personal game with small children. <laughs> Can you find the vegetable in this? All right, so I've got my vegetables in there. Let's add something a little bit more interesting. Strawberries. So the fresh season of strawberries have just started. And back to that whole discussion of soaking. Same as my other greens that grow close to the earth, strawberries, I'm going to soak them. I'm going to put them in a big bowl of water. Mm, I kind of put too many strawberries in here, but you can see the bottom of this is practically black from the dirt that settled down to the bottom. So you put the strawberries in, you let them sit. Strawberry comes out clean, water stays dirty. The key to this is not to take it when you're done and strain the strawberries out, because then you just pour the dirt back on top of them. You actually have to fish them out. 
All right, so I'm gonna add a few strawberries in here. Um, these are the first of the season. They are not terribly sweet yet. So they're just gonna add a little sweet tart flavor into our salad. They're also gonna add a ton of color. Now, because I'm putting the strawberries in and I'm going kind of sweet tart, I don't wanna do a dressing that's, I don't wanna do like Caesar salad dressing or garlic dressing or something that's overly uh, vinegary. So I'm gonna go with an apple cider dressing. Um, if you notice when I'm cutting my strawberries, I'm cutting them into slices. When I put a vegetable in that's something like a strawberry, I want you to know that it's a strawberry, so I don't see the point in cutting it into teeny tiny little pieces. Uh, I want it to look like a beautiful strawberry. It's kind of like when I put mushrooms into stuff. I don't chop my mushrooms terribly fine because I want you to know that there's mushrooms in it. I love mushrooms. All right, so I'm going to do one more strawberry and then we'll go on to our dressing. For your dressing, we're going to use some shallot again. So take off the top, peel it, which is the hardest part of the shallot is peeling it. Um, I like to put shallots in. Um, they give a little bit of the kind of oniony acidity that gives a little extra flavor and depth, but they don't give you that raw onion pungency. They're a little bit more mild. That still doesn't mean I'm going to cut them into giant chunks. I want to cut them into small pieces. So again, I'm going to cut into the onion, and, or the shallot, and I've got the stem end still on there, or the root end still on there, holding it all together. And then I'm going to slice down, and then I'm going to cut it from one side to the other. So this is the base for this particular salad dressing. Um, you could do a salad dressing that had roasted garlic as a base. You could do um, pureed herbs as a base, so you could do you know, green onions and put them in a few food processor and let them puree. Or you could put uh, cilantro into a food processor and let it puree. Uh, anything really to kind of give a flavor base to add to the other flavors. I'm then going to add in my cider vinegar. And then I'm going to add in my honey. Honey do now. And I just want enough honey to kind of bind it all together, but I don't want enough honey to make it overly sweet. I don't want to make a sweet dressing. I just want it there to hold it together. I'm going to put on my lid and give this a light shake just to kind of dissolve the honey a little bit. And by light, I mean aggressive. It was very thick. And then I'm going to add in my olive oil. Again, olive oil will work, vegetable oil will work. The only oil I stay, stay, I tell to stay clear of is canola oil. Do we all know the story of canola oil? It's made from rapeseed. That's made from rapeseed, not grapeseed. Two Rape. different things. Rapeseed. Um, and uh, canola oil is actually, um, it's not a word that exists. It's, it's actually not even a real oil. It's um, Canadian oil, canola. Um, it was originally uh, developed in uh, World War II as a lubricant for tanks. Oh. And when the war ended, they had all these plants and all this stuff, and they didn't know what to do with it. So they tried to feed it to cows, and cows wouldn't eat it. And then they tried to turn it into feed for other animals, and they wouldn't eat it. And then they kept processing it, and denaturing it, and processing it, and denaturing it. And they found a way to make it really low in saturated fats. And so they fed it to people, and they told them it was good for them. It's nothing, it's, it's nothing natural about it. You know, you can have something like a coconut oil that has maybe a, a little bit higher in saturated fat than some other things, but your body can process it. It has fibers in it. It's good for you. Canola oil, yay, no saturated fat. Now it is margarine. Do we know what margarine does to us? We do now. Do we know what canola oil does to us? God only knows. It's All right. Neurotoxin. It is, it's not good stuff. And I, I just, uh, I say that because I, I want you all to be as safe as possible. Please avoid it like the plague. Um, lastly, I have a little bit of extra of this wonderful lettuce here, and I'm just going to cut up a little bit of this and add it into my salad. Um, if I could have the two ladies come help me to set up a little buffet over here for all of you guys. And then um, I would love to answer any of your additional questions while we kind of get you nauseous.